Okay, next up, keeping up with being on time, believe it or not, we have Kyle Polish, who is a good friend of ours, who is the runs the the podcast, the Data Skeptic. I hope you guys all subscribe to that. It's a really a fun little, well, it's not fun necessarily. It is a it's a serious look at data. And um, so we're going to start off with Kyle, who has promised he's going to tell us where uh, Walt Disney's head is at. For sure. We'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into a few other details because I wanted to give a quick presentation on cryonics or the important skeptical question, can the human life be resuscitated? I got interested in this because I was looking into some things about refrigeration and kind of came upon it and was like, oh, that was big when I was growing up. What the heck happened to cryonics? Now, quick disclaimer, I'm really an AI computer science guy. I am not a biologist or a neurologist. I'm doing some casual armchair research here, but luckily a lot of great people have done the real research before me, but uh, there's that disclaimer. Um, so first things first, and I actually screwed this up in the initial description I sent, I sent to Susan. If you search for cryogenics, as I've done here on Google Image Search, you get the uh, idea of what I'm going to talk about today, but technically that is not cryogenics. So there's cryogenics and there's cryonics, which is the term I should be using. Uh, so cryogenics is a real science. It's about, you know, all the things that go on weird at low temperatures. How do we get there and why do we do it? Uh, very real thing. Cryonics, on the other hand, is the effort to preserve a person for later resuscitation. So you have a couple of assumptions with cryonics. First, that uh, the freezing process is non-destructive. Second, that uh, later there'll be some resuscitation technique and that the people of the future will want you back. Um, so a few things we'll unpack there. More specifically, cryonics is the low temperature freezing and preservation of human remains. And I want to stress that it's speculative. No one has ever been brought back yet. Although I guess the uh, cryonics proponents would say that's a yet thing that at some point they will. Uh, nothing so far, of course. Um, quick few notes on the process. I'm not really going to focus on this. Um, there is one sort of straw man criticism you'll hear that, oh, it's just like you freeze anything like vegetables, they go bad or whatever. Uh, that isn't to say that it, this is a solved problem or it's easy, but they do a few more techniques than that. Like uh, your body is flushed of blood and they put other things through your circulatory system to help this preservation process. Uh, I don't know that they help, but uh, it's certainly more than just put somebody on ice. There's a fair amount of work going into it. So where did all of this really come from? If you try and trace back the origins, I mean, you could draw it sooner for speculative writers or, you know, people saying this or that, but most of the research I did points to the book, The Prospect of Immortality, as being sort of the uh, genesis moment of cryonics, uh, published in 1964 by Robert Edinger, this guy right here who went deep into this, went on to form something called the Immortalist Society. And so keep that year in your mind for a bit. Now let's talk about death real quick. Um, this is a word that uh, as you zoom in on it, you will find there are many kinds of death. And these are sort of uh, very high level versions. I'm sure a doctor might be you know, wanting to give us more specifics on this, but from my reading, I saw three broad categories being used. Clinical death, which is when you are no longer breathing and your circulatory system has failed. It is different from brain dead, of course, because uh, your brain can still be functioning and there's even MRI research and things like that. Uh, I don't know in humans, but at least in dogs, I found that they know the brain continues on for a bit afterwards. Terrifying though, I guess that might be. Um, but clinical death by this definition is the kind of thing modern medicine is getting really good at fighting, right? I could maybe lose all circulation and breathing and still come back. That does happen. So clinical death, not uh, the worst way to die, I guess. Brain death is the number one thing you want to avoid. When your brain, you really lose all brain functionality, most no notably involuntary functionality. And then legal death is going to vary quite a bit in a lot of places. I almost didn't want to uh, give a definition because there's so many asterisks on every place I looked, but... Uh, so I'll give you the circular definition. There's legal death when you're no longer alive in the eyes of the law. Um, most often just hand wavy answer seems to be that's brain death, uh, which also can vary by territory. So uh, as will probably come as no surprise, it's very hard to draw a fine line on a topic like this, but you need one when it comes to the topic of cryonics. 
First and foremost, because you cannot cryonically freeze a living person. That is against the law. Um, that's why you might hear people who are cryonically frozen referred to as patients. That's not just tongue in cheek, like, oh yeah, they're, they're just waiting for treatment. We're triaging them. We'll check in on them in a couple hundred years. But also because technically what you're doing is you're donating your body to science. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, your body in a scientific way, I guess, will be held in a cryonics chamber. Uh, so more of an experiment than a promise a company can give you legally. Now let's look optimistically for a bit and uh, bring up the animal that's made it into more talks than any other thing I've ever uh, had in slides, the tardigrade. They are there's a thousand cells in a tardigrade's body, quite a few orders of magnitude smaller than us, but they survived quite extreme temperatures, minus 200 C, 150 C. Um, they can even survive a 10 day trip around the low earth orbit uh, around the sun uh, when dehydrated. And I don't think that's a, you know, a one-up thing that they also did it while dehydrated. I think that has to be, uh, they, they need to lose their water and it puts them into some sort of torpor state. They can even survive massive crushing impacts. So super survivors in a lot of cases, if they can go into this space torpor and come back, I mean, we're not them, but uh, it's all biology. Maybe we can do something like that. Why not? Uh, cryopreservation actually goes on a lot in agriculture. Um, this particular picture comes from a rabbit hole I went down about this uh, university that has kind of like a seed bank type program. So they're able to freeze all of this is a banana right here. Um, they can freeze those cryo cryonically and break or cryogenically, I guess, in this case, and bring them back. So there's real science going on. And as everybody knows, you can lose a tail. So, um, you know, if uh, they bring me back and something's gone bad, as long as it's not my brain, maybe they can grow me a new one. I mean, I haven't taken that great care of my body. Maybe a new one's good. There are some species, uh, mostly in fish, that actually produce their own antifreeze. Um, mostly it's some sort of thing with protein and the sugars get in the right crystal shape and it's able to keep the water liquid in a local area. So there are things that are, have survived extreme temperatures in that regard. Now, we don't have those biological adaptations, but they do exist. And then there's always the myth, have you guys heard of this, that uh, you can freeze a bee and it'll come back just in your household freezer? Well, uh, that's a sad myth for a scientifically curious young man to have to learn is not true. Uh, honeybees cannot actually be frozen. They don't really have any of those adaptations. Um, they're endotherms. So no, if you heard that myth, not true. Um, another kind of interesting one, that process I described earlier where they'll take your blood out and put some kind of antifree stuff in you, it's not total pseudoscience. Uh, that's a vitrification process. This is a study and just one off study, not my field, but something I found where they uh, put some rabbit embryos through this vitrification process and others that just didn't do that, regular old embryos or the control group. So you can see, obviously, this doesn't do well for survivability. Uh, you would not opt into ventrification if you were an embryo, but it's also not zero. Um, so if we want to draw broadly from a conclusion like this, we might think, well, okay, the vitrification process is solvable. So if our body can go through that, perhaps we can be unfrosted one day. Um, and just another curiosity, uh, the human limb can actually be detached for quite a lot longer than I thought was possible. Um, the hard parts are obviously the brain, the part we want to preserve the most. So um, there's all these kind of biological things that might seem like, oh yeah, okay, we're on the right track. Perhaps science can get us to do this. Um, there's a number of things that actually can be cryopreserved. Blood, semen, tumors for some reason, human eggs, embryos, ovarian tissue, plant seeds, and the list goes on and on. Um, all these things are much less complex than the brain, but they survive the freezing process with I assume diminished results similar to the vitrification process. And then a second mention for the day of this American life. I'm not gonna go deep into this, but it covers a story and it's a worthwhile drama if you wanna check it out of this one particular effort to create a uh, actual process and a company around this. It does not go well as the title would suggest. However, one entrepreneur's failure doesn't mean the whole thing's out the window. Um, there are a couple other companies, uh, one in Russia, one in China, and two in the U.S. The most popular one in the U.S. is called Alcor. They will do a whole body preservation for 200000 or a neuropreservation where 
just your head at some point from the neck up, I guess, for a reduced fee of only 80 grand, I guess, because they store you less. And this is real. As far as I can tell, this is not scammy stuff. People do this. There's a list of people who've signed up. This is a legitimate company. Uh, it's similar in regard to um, what I said earlier. You, you aren't getting a promise from them. You're technically donating your body to science. And I found these prices to be surprisingly low, actually. Um, not to be flippant, I certainly don't have 200 grand to just spend on a random thing, or even 80. Like I said, if they can uh, save the brain, I guess they could grow me a body. That stands to reason, I suppose. Uh, 80 sounds strikingly low. Um, I looked a bit into the economics of this because that actually was suspicious to me. I couldn't get a whole lot of details. One part I found was that Alcor says they put 120 of the 200,000 into an annuity. So if you don't know what an annuity is, it's a financial instrument. Imagine you had a lot of money, like a million dollars, and you just wanted to live off of that. You'd put the million dollars in an annuity and kind of live off the interest, but you also want to correct for inflation and stuff like that. So it stands to reason they could have a very well-structured financial thing set up to do all this. But uh, to my casual eye as a small business owner, I don't know, this seems actually much cheaper than seems viable for a long-term uh, storage kind of thing. But those are the market rates. And actually, the rates get even lower. There's another company called the Cryonics Institute that boasts they can do it for 28000 and they only do full body. So very contradictory, conflicting things here. There's an FAQ on their site that gives some hand-wavy answers as to why they're cheaper. But uh, if you want to sign up for something like this, you can do it. And it's not just the billionaires of the world that get to do it if they choose. Um, so you can be frozen. Uh, whether or not you can be unfrozen is the actual important question, right? Uh, for reference, here is a list from Wikipedia of people who are or plan to cryopreserve. Um, more famous ones on the planning to, for my eyes. Uh, one of interest, if you're curious or if you're a Ted Williams fan, there's a lot of controversy around this one. It's not entirely clear that he wanted to be frozen or should have been frozen. Um, but something like this is, of course, kind of expected to be you know, rife with a fair amount of uh, controversy along those lines anyway. So getting to Walt Disney, uh, passed away in 1966, and uh, I'm sure most have heard the rumor that his head was frozen, some say even beneath a special chamber of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, his daughter, if she's to be trusted, wrote in 1972 that, uh, no, that was in fact not his wishes. Walt Disney's head is with Walt Disney's body. Uh, nothing quite mysterious here. But there was an interesting connection, just of note, uh, I asked you to remember a date earlier. We are two years out from the publication of the real start of this topic. And it stands to reason, for me anyway, that maybe uh, Walt Disney was the first rich celebrity to, in the great public eye to pass away close by. And if this was hot in the air, it would be natural for a rumor to get started. I found three independent claims of who started the rumor. Um, so didn't want to summarize those here. but. Uh, not sure where to go with it. Um, let me go back to this list real quick. The ones I recognize are all wealthy people. You know, if you're Seth MacFarlane, two hundred thousand dollars is probably a very small portion of what you leave behind and a risk you're just gambling with. I don't know that. I didn't speak to him obviously, but I don't know that uh, this is necessarily a sign of his massive support or belief in it, as much as it could be a lottery ticket kind of thing. Um, and if so, what's the harm, right? Maybe the effort into this, even if it's not fruitful, will advance refrigeration science. Is this bad? I don't know that it is, but I guess here's the worst what's the harm I could find. This is Elaine Walker, 47, who actually canceled her cell phone plan in order to cover the fees she's paying to get her cell cryopreserved. Uh, I, she's an adult. That's her choice. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. So let's get into the real question. Is cryogenics, uh, sorry, I made the mistake here. This should be is cryonics pseudoscience. Can we actually freeze and recover the human body? A uh, quick note before we get into that, connectomics is the study of, you know, how the brain's wired up. And as you can see there, that's kind of one data visualization of what the brain's data, or at least data taken from an MRI suggests about the brain. I had the opportunity to go to a neurology lab related to Data Skeptic, and um, they had just finished the installation of their new fancier MRI scanner. I think they went from like five Teslas to eight, some large change like that. And they were showing me the differences. And 
the lower original model they had, the brains looked blurry to me. Uh, obviously, they got scientific value out of them. But then when I saw these new ones, the amount of structure and details that they got of this advanced equipment uh, was striking in how much more you could see. I was able to identify after a couple of just examples they showed me of what was a severe case of Alzheimer's or not, because there was so much information in those. Uh, this is a field that's getting really advanced. We're taking very fine-grained measurements of the brain, uh, studying it, knowing things about it and its structure, though not necessarily how to put it back together or uh, how to make a copy of one or any of the things like that that might be required. Um, but this is real science. And what else is real science? And this is along the lines of what's really convinced me that this is somewhat implausible. Uh, this guy up here at the top is the roundworm, or this Latin name I'm not going to even try. It's uh, maybe second only to the fruit fly as the most famous sort of studied model species. Basically, we know everything about it. Uh, its brain, how it works. Uh, and this scientist reports that even with all of that, there's no way to really simulate one fully. So even though we know kind of every in and out of it, they can't, in a computer as of yet, model it. Maybe the, and I guess the takeaway here is in short brain activity cannot be inferred from some synaptic neuroanatomy, that just a, a snapshot of the brain is incomplete. So we would really need to thaw out that brain. Uh, there's no like copy process or anything like that. So you are hedging entirely on innovation that uh, has not come to pass and may not come to pass. Um, in addition to that, there are other things besides just sort of how your neurons are wired up that may have an impact on who you are. Uh, hormones, chemicals in your brain, the electrical potentials in your brain, and many other factors I found different people talking about could all be important components of the state of your system and capturing your consciousness. Um, yet cryopreservation does not capture hardly any of that other things. It captures basically your uh, brain tissue structure uh, at best. So the degree to which any of these other things impact uh, consciousness, there may not even be a possibility here. So my thought, final thoughts and observations in my you know, couple of week foray into this topic. First and foremost, it's considered really a minority position by most of the scientific community. There are a few seemingly serious um, proponents who have academic degrees and all this kind of stuff, as you'd expect in most fields. My takeaway from looking at it is that this is a little bit like Bigfoot. You know, if you aren't a biologist, if I present to you an idea like Dogman, there's lots of quick ways we can reject Dogman as a, a cryptozoological creature. Bigfoot is different because hypothetically it's plausible. Such a creature could exist, just happens not to. Cryonics could be possible, just happens not to today. And um, proving a negative is always tough in science. Now we may get to the point where we say there are structures that are always destroyed uh, in the freezing process. Even if you've removed all the water and you've done all these things, or there's some destructive element that cannot for sure be reversed in the future. But it's that for sure that's always a challenging hedge. Um, so, you know, I notate this about as much as like, hey, aliens could show up tomorrow, could happen. Uh, we'll have to wait and see in some regards. There are many notable public supporters, you know, Kurtzweil and people like that, um, but not a lot that I could find that were scientific thought leaders per se. Um, I'm, obviously, there's some people very focused in this field, but not, you know, they're also knee deep in the field. I didn't find a lot of people from other domains kind of pointing at this and saying like, yeah, yeah, I think that's all real. I'm going for that. Uh, it's certainly not pseudoscience. Uh, we can't rule out the possibility of freezing and unfreezing a person and for them to regain some semblance of consciousness and continuity. Yet we are so far from it today. It's not the kind of thing I think science really would debate about. You know, quantum computing is something we don't have today, but I truly believe there might be a practical quantum computer in my lifetime because I'm seeing advancements in that direction. I was unable to find any of those big milestones in this field, just kind of the hope and the dream that the future is going to figure it all out. And really, at the end of the day, that means it lacks falsifiability. If the claim is always that the problems will be solved later, uh, you have to wait till later to prove it wrong. So... In the end of it, uh, I don't think I'll freeze myself. I don't know that uh, anyone who's currently frozen will one day be unfrozen. This seems like, if not pseudoscience, the kind of thousand year science scale that um, isn't really all that interesting to me to learn that much more about unless I've made some errors.
So hope you guys found that informative. I certainly found it informative. <laughs> that was really interesting. I, I want to point out that uh, Disney's daughter said that his head is attached to his body and that's, they're all connected. But she didn't say he wasn't frozen. She just said they're connected. They could, he could have been not his head frozen, but his whole body's frozen. So you just, just there telling you, you know, maybe. Well, there was a wink emoji in the original text that I took out, I guess. Yeah. Maybe that's what she meant. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, what I want to ask is, this is from Mono. Does the process preserve the ability to generate, wait, it moved generate and send out neurotransmitters um i don't i don't believe so i think a cryonics proponent would tell you that um they would have to kind of kick start you on that process because yeah all electrical activity is going to stop okay from steam if trump were frozen more than he is already who would defrost him in any future <laughs> I just well, I, I, I think it'd be kind of interesting to see that. Rob Palmer asks, do you know, or if you could look when you get a chance, what the what kind of state the Wikipedia page is on these subjects, if if they're not in the greatest shape, then you know, please let him know so we can get these. They were good. Uh, no, they were good resources. I think it would uh, be a high bar to move them forward at this point. There wasn't any pseudoscience really to be said, and I sourced a lot of information from Wikipedia. Oh, that's that's amazing. I love that. I love hearing that. <laughs> Milo says, if the power goes out, they have to eat you. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was something I didn't touch on enough, like the the economics and the power uh, uh, and preservation of this thing is what's really challenging in a lot of interesting ways. Like, I mean, you are hedging on a continuity that would be pretty unprecedented. Yeah, Romero does mention that. He says, do they guarantee they'll have electricity to keep you alive? What if there's a power loss? I guess if it goes out it, and there's no battery backup or something, that's, that's it, right? Yeah, I mean... Uh, if, if I were running such a facility, I'd have several layers of power backup and all that. But And of course, as people, we're getting better at having continuity and alternate source of energy and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's uh, certainly a, when you think about the long scale you might be dealing with, quite a challenge. So Janine says, thanks, Kyle. Very good. I worked in plant cryopreservation. It's the same. It's the sample size that makes it work. Water can be removed and protein structure remained. Yeah, a lot of science there for sure. And I also thank you, Janine, for the correction on the name that I covered the first couple of slides. <laughs> um, I'm looking at some of the others. Oh, oh, Lois says there's a liquid nitrogen backup. Sure, that could work. The liquid nitrogen is really how they do the freezing process. And mm -hmm. um, so if you have some extra, that'd be good. Yeah, might might not unfreeze them right away. Like if the electricity went away or something like that, there's probably some kind of time that they have to be able to, you know, I, well, who's going to complain? I mean, Listen, we're talking, we're talking. The future's years problem. Now. They're going to have to worry about that later. All these half frozen people. Oh, I heard, a, a, oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd heard something on this and they were talking about life insurance policies that you could take your life insurance policy and have that somehow pay for it. That's right. Yeah. So um, it's, common for a lot of people end up with a life insurance policy that if you've had it for a long time could have a major payout depending on you know a lot of complexities around that kind of stuff but it's not surprising for a person to pass and leave a big insurance policy payout behind and the a lot of the way this is set up is basically like you sign up for a special thing that's for sure going to go to the company and there's a little bit of drama there like apparently the family can block this and then the money can go in a different direction so um you know, that didn't feel like it was core skepticism, but I think there's some interesting family drama and stories in that area as well. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, we're going to freeze. We're going to freeze dad and we're going to use the $200,000 of inheritance that you were going to get. Yeah. Uh, exactly. No, you aren't. I want that $200,000. Dad said yeah. no. I mean, my, well, maybe they could get a seance or they get somebody to say no i heard from the meat from the dead that he doesn't well, he's cold <laughs> <laughs> he's really cold so um 
The other thing is, is that when somebody dies, you have a very limited amount of time. I mean, they have to be dead. So you have a right. very small amount of time to get them into this, this uh, nitrogen, right? I mean, it's not like you yeah. can say, oh, I, I'm dead. So ship me over to some other area and they'll take care. I don't think there's that. That's kind of right. Time, right. You have to have people on standby. In fact, the one of the companies, I think the one in Michigan, they encourage you to die at their facility because then everyone's lovely. on staff. How yeah. lovely. Do you think they walk amongst those those bins and talk to them? Like, you know, like, oh, there's Joey over there and Francis over there. Hey, Francis, you know, your, your family sent us a nice message saying, I don't know, how do you disassociate yourself from those vials? I don't know. Yeah. Um, my take, so I looked for two things I didn't find. One was like interesting religious zealotry around this, but uh, it didn't seem there was a whole lot of response. There was some like stuff in like Christian magazines that they said, oh, it's fine. This doesn't conflict with uh, faith somehow. I don't know. Um, I did read one personal account where uh, a man who was an atheist was married to a woman who was a theist and she was concerned his soul would be stuck in his body if it was frozen. She wanted the money. What are you talking about? She wasn't caring about his soul. She wanted the inheritance. <laughs> like that woman who said she's trying to, she's not got a cell phone plan or something like that so that she could pay for this. It's like, yeah, she really? gave up the cell phone plan to cover the payments. Kind of sad. That's very sad. Uh, one, one more question. I'll let this get in here. My question, I think this is from Adrian, about Trump was not just a joke. Isn't there a major political and ethical issue about whether to defrost whom and when? You know, there isn't a whole lot talked about around that. And I think it's because of the just broad implausibility of the science. I think if this was something that was more like a quantum computer, like, yes, we'll probably have one at some point, there would be more ethical thought put into it. But this is like the kind of philosophy you do as like a high freshman after your philosophy class, right? When you're stoned. Yeah. <laughs> it would, yeah, that's what you see all the time is they say, Let's freeze ourselves for the future when they have it figured out how to unfreeze us. There's never a timeline or or at what point is this, or do we think we're ready? Who's going to be the first one we're going to yeah. unfreeze? Who wants to be the volunteer for the first one to be unfrozen and, and, and make the mistakes on? Well, that I would imagine it's the one that's the most likely to be resuscitated. So you look through the details and like there's a little bit of drama about some of those people I listed who have been frozen. Like one person wasn't put in fast enough, so you probably wouldn't pick him. Um, somebody had a power issue, I'm sure you wouldn't pick that person. So like who's the most likely candidate is probably how that choice would be motivated, I would assume. Yes, whoever, depends on what they died of. I mean, if it was something, I guess it was right. fixable or... I actually think the so. freezing process is the thing you want to worry more about. Oh, just the whole idea is just, wow. Anyway, <laughs> wonderful questions. I wish we could talk about this longer. Kyle will probably be around through the lunchtime if you want to For talk sure. to him. Uh, real quick, real quick, what's new on, what's next on Data Skeptic? Next on Data Skeptic, uh, I think this week we might have coming up, I'm talking to Richard Saunders about the Great Psychic Prediction oh, Project. Oh, that's a good plug. He's going to be speaking to us later today. Yeah, yeah. So I won't spoil anything, but some great stats. Yeah. So that's the uh, Data Skeptic. It's data Skeptic. Find it all you your podcast, us. whatever oh, yeah. applications you want to find. He's got a long series of them. Some of my favorites are the ones where he speaks to his wife, Linda, because I can understand those better. <laughs> she goes, she get asked questions that makes good questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. slow down and say, oh, okay, let me explain that a little bit better. <laughs> I really like that. All right. Thank you so much, Kyle, for speaking to us My today. Pleasure. You always do such interesting talks. Um, we have a whole bunch of talks from Kyle on um, the Monterey County Skeptics uh, or About Time uh, YouTube channel that this will eventually add it to. But he, he does unique talks almost every time. Thank you, Kyle. For sure.